Hi, everybody. Welcome to Stress Free Lounge. I'm your host, Bill Whittle. On the, uh, we are already 59 minutes and 52 seconds away from the uh, one-minute show. Uh, the one-minute show probably be a little better investment of our time. The one-hour show on the Stratus Free Lounge. I hope everybody's doing well. Howdy, howdy. Uh, been a very uh, interesting week, of course, and I'm going to keep the introductory remarks nice and short. Uh, it's not a new chair, Dave Big Booty. It's actually an old chair. And I was told nobody wants to see the headrest, and then I saw Steve Green doing it, and I thought... The, the truth is I've been doing so much writing lately for um, for this new podcast that uh, I found the old chair. I was just kind of slinking, slinking down. So uh, it's actually uh, a good chair. I love it. Um, so anyway, uh, just a little bit of news, and then we will proceed to the questions. Uh, there has been, um, a, a, you know... It, the way I, I'm not going to, I'm not only am I not going to get into the details about how it actually played out, but just suffice it to say, they were astonishing. But uh, in addition to many other wonderful things having happened in the last uh, couple of months, um, one of the things that happened was uh, we were able to secure enough um, funding to do the first of these um, uh, science fiction video messages. Now, it's enough to do it. Uh, it's enough to get it done, um, and that's important. That's all that really matters. Uh, it doesn't mean we can do it in uh, in a week or anything. It's going to take a while, but that doesn't matter because we have uh, the means to get it done. So after a mere year, two years of talking about it, and one year after I gave up on pursuing it full time, uh, it looks like we'll have the means to get this thing going. So. Uh, the first step will be to take one of those characters. Do I have them handy? I might. I might. Um, where is it? I thought I might have left it on the desktop, and if I don't see it pretty quick, I'm going to just bail. Let's see. It's, um, why is it organizing things in a strange way? All right, let's not worry about it. Uh, I'm going to take um, the first of these uh, characters that I've shown you guys before. Uh, I've already talked to a, a guy who I've known for a long time who's going to get it into um, Unreal Engine. Once it's in Unreal Engine, we can do um, facial and body mocap. And once we've got facial and body motion capture, then everything after that is basically downhill. Uh, anything um, that... Uh, that happens after that is great. I kept bouncing uh, against this um, wall uh, of um, just spent a year, uh, more like a year and a half, trying to get the one thing that I couldn't get done done, and that was get these characters moving and talking. I tried it in Motion Builder. I, t I tried it in 3D Studio. I tried it in, in iClone. I tried it in everything. And after about a year, it finally became clear to me that this whole thing had to happen inside a game engine. I had all these great characters I'm very proud of, I think look great, but I could not get them into Unreal. I could not get them to do what I wanted to. So um, so that's, that's really, really good news. And the reason it's good news is because um, we will now be able to do one. I've, I've talked about this a lot. I've, I've pitched it to individuals. I've, I've pitched it to groups. And most people still think uh, it that I'm talking about doing a video game, and I can hardly blame them for that. It's just me not being clear enough. But nevertheless, I think um, the ability to show somebody, just to say, here it is, take a look, uh, and and see how the how the lesson gets uh, delivered um, in terms of like, no, well, you're not going to talk about anything. We're just going to show you how ridiculous this idea is. And we're going to show you how ridiculous it is in a way that we can't do in the real world because, you know, I don't want to see people actually gunned down in, in real life underneath the sign that says no murder zone. Um, so anyway, that's very, very good news. And, um, and uh, all of it made possible by a remarkable individual uh, whose uh, story I, I think I would like to tell. I won't tell it, um, I won't tell it like this, but I'll tell it in those, uh, in those videos. Um, I've, got a, I've got a character uh, who I think is pretty much has been just perfect for this guy in his life and he's a real American patriot and, a, and a, one of these guys who's worked for you know four or five decades behind the scenes keeping us all safe at night while the rest of us are out uh, playing video games so 
it was um, it was a near miraculous thing, and uh, and he didn't didn't just help out the um, the video game thing. It really was just tremendous, tremendous. So I know you're probably watching this uh, sailor, and if you are, thank you again. Um, okay, that'll do it for uh, for pregame comments. Uh, it'll be nice. It'll probably be a couple weeks before we get uh, a character actually in in. Um, uh, Unreal, but once he's in Unreal, I'm going to start publishing all of the tests. I'm going to do all of that. Uh, uh, Aesop's asking if we have a, a link to the funds for that. I think we do. Um, give me one second, and I will post it in the comments stream, and, would, and we're going to go a little wider with it here in a little bit. Come on. This should be it. This is not taking me to the right link. This is taking me to the PayPal page, and that's not where I want to be. Um, I will have it next week, pal. I, I thought I had it right in front of me, but it looks like I don't, unless I picked the wrong link, and I don't think I did. Uh, I must have just saved the wrong, yeah, saved the wrong page. My fault. I'll get that taken care of. I'll have it for you next time. Um, and I should have some things to show in the very near future. Okay, so anyway, moving on. Um, uh, let's see. We're going to go mostly to the website today. Uh and um, we'll do some Facebook questions as well. So why don't we uh, go right to BillBiddle.com, find out what we got, because we have um, 58 minutes, I'm sorry, 53 minutes and 22 seconds remaining. So here we go. Um, looking at the BillWiddle.com webpage. Come on. What are you doing? BillWiddle.com webpage. You can go right away. There you go. And you can go here. All right, here we go. <laughs> the first question, which I had not seen prior to doing this, is can you give me an update on the initiative to educate you to men, uh, educate uh, men of the country via online gaming? Uh, Michael, uh, what, a, what an astute question. I hope that update was uh, good enough and we're going um, to be actually delivering footage. Not, I'm not putting any. Somebody uh, asked me, a, a known miscreant, um, asked me about when this might be ready, and I said, probably about three for seven, I'm thinking maybe six, but then it's like, you have no idea when it's gonna be ready. I don't have any idea. So we grow in little steps uh, once the pain reaches uh, unbearable levels. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's just great, 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 great news, and really has um, given me a real shot of electricity. It's a little dark in here. Uh, uh, Anyway, um, so that's great. So uh, moving on, we'll get to Facebook in a minute. Uh, Steve Darrow and Dave Big Booty, I saw that you got something you want me to, um, to look at, and I'll take a look at that in a minute. Steve Darrow says, if you could travel back in time to per personally witness and discover the definitive answer to one of the great mysteries, where would you go and which mystery would you solve? I'm thinking mysteries like why Stonehenge was built, how were the pyramids were built, who exactly were the first humans in the new world, that sort of thing. One provision is that you would be an invisible observer, unable to be harmed or to change events you witness. That's a superb question. And you know, I, I thought I would have had that. Um, I would have had that answer. I got the feeling I had that floating around in the back of my mind. Uh, I have some candidates. Um, I guess if I really had to, Oh, it's, it's a great mystery, because uh, this is not so much a mystery, it's just something I would like to have seen. Um, well, that's a great question. You know it's a great question, because I'm not speaking. Uh, a lot of the great mysteries uh, I don't consider to be mysteries. I don't think it's a mystery how the pyramids were built. And I don't think Stonehenge is, is a mystery, or Easter Island. I don't think um, the Loch Ness Monster, the Bermuda Triangle are mysteries, none of that. There are definitely things that have happened that are um, unknown. You know, I'll tell you, on my list of top three, if I had all of history, I would, I would like to know what the hell happened um, uh, to, um, for the love of God, Epstein. I'd like to know what happened. I, I'd, like to, I'd like to be recording what actually happened to, to Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, of all the things that I've seen in my lifetime, that is... The closest, oh, Dave Big Booty says, watch the Apollo 17 launch. Well played, my friend. Um, uh, but of all the things that I've seen in my life, that one, the Epstein uh, murder, is 
um, is the one thing that I've seen in my life that most approaches a movie in terms of the sheer kind of, oh my God, kind of. Uh, there may be a perfectly good explanation for it. He may have just committed suicide and a lot of things. You got to, uh, you know, you got to, you got to give reality a chance um, before you start invoking all kinds of uh, conspiracies. But that one, I have to tell you, that one looks so bad. And I'll tell you what's really disturbing about the Epstein thing is that we just took it. You know, I know some people absolutely sure he was murdered. I'm not one of those people because I wasn't there. Uh, I don't think you can be absolutely sure on the basis of the evidence that we have. Um, but uh, that one is is really smells bad and and not only smells bad, um, it uh, it directly Im impacts our you know our lives on a daily basis. I saw Eric Blake said he'd like to know what happened to Amelia Earhart. I'm I am I'm virtually positive. i'm I'm in ninety nine point something positive. Uh, that I know about what happened to Amelia Earhart. I think that story is just getting stronger and stronger. There is exceed exceedingly compelling evidence. I mean, really, really compelling evidence that she uh, crash landed on uh, or, or, or ditched the plane just off the shore of an island uh, south of the one she was aiming for. And um, the evidence seems to indicate that uh, her, her navigator might have lived for a couple days. She lived considerably longer. Um, but she ended up dying of starvation or exposure. And uh, the reason they, they found perfume bottles uh, from, the, from her period, they found shoes that match her. There's a photograph of what looks like landing gear sticking up uh, in the uh, lagoon, just taken at random from two or three years after the fact. They just found it there in a the corner of a photograph. Uh, artifacts, all kinds of things. They, I don't think they've gotten... Um, I don't think they've gotten... DNA confirmation yet, uh, and one of the things um, that's hard is they, they, they're having a hard time finding body parts, and then um, one of the reasons they had a hard time fighting body parts is because that particular island, which name escapes me at the moment, uh, has has land crabs like this big, and they just snip things up and, and take them apart, but when I saw the, I mean, perfume bottles that match the kind of perfume she was known to wear, all of the stuff from the correct period, uh, all of it. Um, uh, Steve says a uh, strong documentary evidence that she was captured by the Japanese. I don't believe that because I don't think you need it. Um, I think that that explanation is uh, a good one. I thought the, I thought the most likely answer was she just ditched in the Pacific and and the, and sank. How hard is that to understand? I was actually quite astonished they found anything at all. Um, but uh, in any event, uh, they are going out again, and um, and they are going to uh, look for wreckage of the aircraft. Needless to say, if they find parts of an Electra, that's that's it. Um, and by the way, ha having recently gotten um, more interested in naval battles than I had been previously, uh, Paul Allen, who died not too long ago, deserves a real... Um, Real shout out, not that he needs it from me. Paul Allen was the guy who um, put the money into uh, Spaceship One and, and got Bert Rutan as his own space program. And Paul Allen has funded a research vessel that in the course of the last two or three years has found something like 20 shipwrecks. They found the Indianapolis, they found the, they, they found the Amato, they found Musashi, they found the Yorktown, they found all of this stuff. Um, and uh, it was just really really good of him it's just this is what you this is what i would do if i had some money real money i would just do these kind of things yeah sure absolutely um stout kid asks about the malaysian airlines 370 mystery i've heard a pretty compelling answer to that too it's written by a guy named william languish hard to spell his last name but um he did a long detailed article he's an he's, a, he's one of the best investigative reporters i've ever read and he's an excellent um he's an excellent writer as well and uh, the answer to that, uh, Stout Cat, looks very, very compelling that, uh, that it was a pilot suicide, that the guy took off, got him up to altitude, uh, had the co-pilot go in the back and check something for some reason, locked the door, and then before they could batter down the door or take any other action, he depressurized the aircraft. Uh, and, then, um, 
and then flew on for hours. Nobody knows how long he might have lived or died. The plane could have continued on for six, seven, eight hours. Uh, in fact, that may in fact be the most likely case. It just The plane just flew until it ran out of gas, and it flew south. Um, they have found uh, wreckage that has been positively identified from, um, from Flight 370. Uh, and there was one guy who was tracking this wreckage down and by himself basically put the pieces together. And we found, found part of a, 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 a aileron here. We found something over there. Uh, he really deserves a, a lot of credit. I love that, that kind of thing. Um, I was, uh, in relation to the, to the person who had, who had um, so generously put up the money to make this, uh, these uh, science fiction videos uh, possible, uh, it told me about how he was growing, <laughs> such a great story. He grew up, when he was a kid, grew up in Hollywood. In fact, lived about a two-tenths of a mile from my house, honestly. Just an easy, easy, easy walk, just around the corner from where I live now. And he was telling me a story that he had, um, been, when he was a kid, he used to hang out with a bunch of other kids, and these kids knew, some reason or another, were connected to Errol Flynn, of all people. So they used to hang out at Errol Flynn's house. And... Um, and from the stories I've heard, first-person stories I've heard, uh, he was everything you would kind of hope that he would be. Well, no question he's a raving uh, alcoholic, I think, no doubt about that. But he was, from, what, from the sound of it, Errol Flynn was actually Errol Flynn. And just to give you this quick little story, because um, it does involve a mystery, uh, my friend was saying that um, when he was young, he was over at Errol Flynn's house, and they used to hang out because he had horses, and they would just romp around up in the uh, Mulholland Drive, Coinga Pass, all that other stuff. Um, and then uh, while they're out there hiking, they come across a, uh, a, like a mound covered with bushes and trees and stuff, and they kind of pull it away, and they find a monument, a monument to the Battle of Coinga Pass, which I'd never heard of. I don't think they'd ever heard of it. And it looked like this thing would be completely forgotten, utterly forgotten. So they went back, um, told Errol Flynn that uh, they found uh, a monument on his property. And Errol Flynn said, a monument, eh, boys, are you sure? He said, yeah, we're sure. So he said, all right, let's go explore. So then he disappears. And he comes out five, ten minutes later, and he's dressed in the, in the, in the bush jacket. He's got the, the, you know, the, the pith helmet. He's got the, 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 the riding crop. He's jod purse. He's ready to go out and, and be Errol Flynn exploring the banquets. So anyway, I, I made a determined effort to find this monument, and uh, it's hardly a word of it. There's a number of other things that are associated with it, and then finally, I found it. And, um, and it's bigger than he remembers it. It's possible that it was rebuilt because the actual memorial structure is not that great looking, but nevertheless, nevertheless, uh, it was a fun thing to track down because it's, I've never seen anything like this in LA. It's like you, you go to a dead end street off of Mulholland Drive, uh, very near Flynn Ranch Road. So that's a good sign that I was in the right place. And there's a, a dead end street and there's just one little metal gate there and nothing on it, no markers, nothing, just a black metal gate. It's unlocked. You open this gate, you go down this long kind of corridor. There's these dirt stairs that go up and then another flat land, and then on the top of another set of stairs, and there's the, the monument, and it has John Fremont's name on it and all the rest of it. So anyway, um, that, was, uh, that was really cool. It's a fun mystery uh, to look at, although we're not 100% sure we found the right one, but I'm pretty confident. We'll see. Um, okay. Uh, Okay, um, scanning down here. Uh, if anybody needs to contact me, looking at the comments on the on the uh, billwhittle.com page, and I'm um, not exactly sure how to handle this, but info at billwhittle.com will get to me. So if uh, if there, if your person needs to send me a personal message, I would be delighted to uh, handle it. Um, okay, uh, moving on. Ralph Capera. We'll get to Facebook in a little bit. Ralph Capera says, I've been re-watching old Star Trek, uh, the original series, and I've noticed that the episodes are routinely 50 minutes. Newer fare, like Mad Men, are in the 42-minute range. As a writer, what do those extra eight minutes, 15%, mean to story arc and character development? That's a pretty good question, actually. It's not the length, Ralph, that, that's a trouble. 
it's the breaks. So you have to write for the breaks. And I actually think that makes the script better. I really do. I think it makes it much better. Because basically in, in that 50-minute in that, uh, hour, you have, to, you have to present four cliffhangers. You have to present four dramatic turns that are going to get people back after the commercial break. And um, and the original series had those four breaks, and you can you can just see them. You just think back on an episode, dun dun dun, dun, dun and go to commercial, and you come back and you get the answer. Um, so, I think most people get in the hang of of writing. Certainly, the professionals who did most of the writing for Star Trek had by that point gotten very used to uh, the format for a, a dramatic uh, hour on network TV. Um, the only thing I have to say about the, the limitations of the time and stuff and shorter than that is, is that um, when I was editing Sunday Morning Shootout for AMC, I did 170 episodes, something like that. And that show had to be 23 minutes, 30 seconds to the frame, to the 30th of a second. And, um, and that was a bit challenging, actually, because... You have a little bit of, of cushion space in terms of the of the credits. You can run those a little longer, a little shorter, that kind of thing. But to get it to the to end on that second was um, was was really kind of challenging. But like, but again, once I got the hang of it, it was like, yeah, okay, just no problem. Just kind of letting the air in and out of a balloon, kind of thing. I need to cut four seconds out of something. I'll just take this one remark or whatever the case. And so that was that was pretty much it. Um, I don't know whether we're it seems odd to me that the show times are shorter now than they were then. I would have thought, I would have guessed that there would have been more commercials back then. But um, when you say newer fare like Mad Men are in the 42-minute range, uh, I don't know. I mean, surely Mad Men didn't air with commercials. I'm, I can't imagine. Uh, I've seen episodes on YouTube, but uh, it's a network show. I mean, I mean it's a... Um, Paper, uh, pay cable show. So I don't, I don't imagine they had commercials in it, did they? I, I don't know. Don't know the answer to that. But um, one thing I do know is that uh, the golden age of television that people talk about in the, you know, with, oh, I don't know, Steve Allen, all, all, you know, your show of shows, all that stuff. The golden age of TV is, um, is now really the, the one show that changed, I think, if I had to pick one, the show that changed television forever, uh, forever, and turned television into something that not only could match movies but in, in many ways surpassed them, um, was The Sopranos. I think The Sopranos um, I think that show really changed things. I have to say, I'm just glanced at the comments section, and uh, Laolas AOC says, oh wait a minute, sorry, Sorry, it was Stout Cat. Breaking news. Nancy Pelosi's son was an exec at a gas company that did business in Ukraine. Well, isn't that interesting? I don't know if it's true, but it would explain the hysterical um, reaction. And um, anyway, uh, that's that. So... Move it on because we got a lot of ground to cover. So I've just been given some instructions that I missed an important question and I will refresh my browser. Oh, okay. Here we go. Uh, this is from, uh, I guess it's from Bo Monday. After 10 years of court battles, environmental impact studies, cultural impact studies, and every other bit of red tape, the 30-meter telescope was finally granted approval to start construction on top of the tallest mountain in the world, Mauna Kea, in Hawaii. When he says the tallest mountain in the world, you may say, oh, wait, Everest is considerably higher than that. But measured from the base, which is thousands of feet below the ocean, Mauna Kea is the tallest uh, mountain on Earth. On the day construction was to start, a band of native Hawaiians showed up and blockaded the only road up the mountain, completing halting, completely halting construction. They refused to leave. For three months now, there's been a stalemate, and the government seems powerless to enforce the law. You have noticed there's a lot of that going around. Are we no longer a country of laws, but now one of outrage mobs? Yeah, you've got your answer, Bo. I mean, there's your answer. Um, 
we have become a society where the most unhinged or angry or, or whatever people control everybody else. They control them. If somebody doesn't like, forget the Christmas display, although that's a perfectly good example. There's a cross on a hill. I don't like a cross on a hill. I'm an atheist. Well, that cross has been there for 80 years. Well, I'm an atheist and I find it offensive. Well, then I guess we're going to have to take the cross down. And there's been more and more and more and more of this, and I think it's an absolute cancer and it needs to be excised. The, um, you know, I've been watching all of this, uh, you know, the impeachment thing and all that jazz, and then I've been watching, um, just been watching the left just, I'm not talking about imploding politically. I mean, I, I hadn't realized that, that the philosophy, the progressive philosophy would be so self-destructive so fast. Um, but to give you an idea of where we are in the realism uh, out there among the left, the reality-based community, um, the woman who was in charge of Planned Parenthood, which is not exactly a rock rib conservative uh, bastion, um, was fired because the woman who was running Planned Parenthood said that men cannot have abortions. And for that, she was fired. So um, when, when your philosophy, when your political philosophy is to say, we're going to fire the person who's left-wing enough to be in charge of abortions for this country, we're going to fire them because she had the audacity to say um, that um, men can't have abortions, which is the definition of men, needless to say. It's the actual... Anyway, you get the idea. A, a world like that can't continue, and, and it won't continue. And so what we see is... Uh, see, here's the thing. Progressivism is based on two things. It's based on envy, and it's based on um, outrage. And the mechanic of, of progressivism is... I'm going to make a voter outraged enough at what somebody else did, and their envy of that other person will be satisfied by me taking from that person and giving it to that voter. That satisfies not only their envy, but their outrage. But I can't do this without outrage. If there's no, if there's no outrage, none of this works. If somebody's richer than you, and it doesn't matter in any way you can see, uh, then you're not as willing to go out and lynch the guy. But... They manufacture outrage, and then they use the outrage to drive envy, and the envy drives votes. And that's how it works. It's a very, very, very simple machine. Very simple. And the problem for progressives is, is that the fuel that runs progressivism is outrage. If you're not outraged, there's no reason, there's no reason to change everything. They're coming and saying, well, we're going to change this and change that, and we're going to fundamentally change this, 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 and this. If things are good, why would you need that? If things were good, you, you not only don't need progressives, but you want them to just bug off. So... You have to make outrage, and if there's real outrage there, fantastic. Uh, but if um, if there's not, then you have to manufacture it, and so um, and so this is what they do now. They manufacture outrage. They manufacture it any way they can because not only does it keep the politics going, but it makes them special. You've got I don't know how many Hawaiians there are, you know, but they're but they're now stopping their national news. Um, and, uh, and what do you say about that, you know? Um, it's, just, uh, it's just nuts. So um, I'm, I'm a lot more sanguine than I was before about things. I really do think that, um, that things are just, just rolling downhill faster and faster, and the faster they go on... Uh, the sooner they're going to tip over and, and, and people are just going to go. I say all of this because uh, at this point, the, I think the country is not just ready for it. I think the country is aching for, begging for, screaming for, dying for somebody to just get up and say, it's time to end this foolishness. This is ridiculous. You're going to let these weenies tell you what to do just because they tell you what to do? You're going to let these lunatics... These lunatics, these insane people, run society because you're not willing to have them say you're not a nice person? Come off of it. They're nuts. They're barking mad. And everybody knows it. And everybody knows it. So I think if I was the governor of Hawaii, I would say simply, uh, this is 
your complaints and your and your concerns have been heard and and they've been and they've been uh, debated, and the answer is we don't find them um, compelling. So since um, we have done all of this stuff legally, <coughs> we will give you 24 hours to disband. And if you don't disband, then we will come in and arrest you. We'll do it as gently as we can, but we can't make any promises. And um, and there you go, done. But no. And it's progressives again. It's progressives always backtracking. Kids want this country. You can you can put a pin in when this country took the turn that ended up in this kind of mess. And that was the day, the hour, the hour that the faculty of Yale Law School decided to let the students who had taken over the law school have their way, turn it into negotiations. If they had simply gone in and arrested those kids, we wouldn't be in this trouble. But no. Well, their concerns are legitimate, and we should listen very carefully to the concerns of the young people. All right, that's it. It's over. Civilization ends, you know, for you guys anyway. Uh, let's see. Go to the Facebook page, see what we got there. Where is that comment stream? I should refresh this, I reckon. Uh, I better refresh it because uh, if I don't refresh it in 28 minutes and 33 seconds, we're going to be out of time. Um, come on, baby. Uh, there's Dems Double Down, there's that. I don't know if it's true for you guys, but if you own a page, if you're a page owner, they stack so much stuff in such a weird order, it's just constantly tough. Um, all right, well, 22 comments. Eric Blake, uh, so Bill, you've already shared your memories as an apprentice writer on Cheers. To be, con to be precise about this, I was a freelancer who was invited to do spec scripts for Cheers. Um, who would have written officially had the show continued? I think there's a pretty good chance of that. Um, obviously, Cheers didn't continue because reasons, but as we all know, we got Frasier in its place. Were you ever in talks to come aboard to write for Frasier? Had you written for Frasier, what might you have done differently than the show as is, and how do you suspect your life today would have been different? Um, I, first of all, I was not uh, invited to go. I, I'm not entirely sure how closely Frasier and Cheers were connected to each other, but the bottom line here is not... Uh, any failure on their part, it's a failure on my part. I just plain, I just had enough, I just gave up. I went to um, the Mojave and I was flying gliders. Uh, and to the degree that I could have pursued the writing career in LA, it would have meant um, more years of being a limo driver and uh, just barely being able to make the rent and you know getting home at three o'clock in the morning and, uh, and the stress. I'm a pretty tightly wound person, and, and I took all of those limo rides, uh, which were almost exclusively, with, with enough exceptions you could count on, on, on two hands, uh, they, were, they were taking businessmen to the airport, and they were late, and I felt obligated to get them there, and I went through it, um, and, I, and I, I was 30... 30 years old, 31 years old. I was running through the airport. I just felt this thing. I just kind of took a step, went to the doctor. Turned out I was um, having heart palpitations because there was so much adrenaline in my bloodstream. I was on beta blockers for a while at age, you know, 30. Uh, and that that wasn't going to do it. Um, but I'm happy to speculate about the, the, the writing thing, even though I don't want to oversell the degree that I was there. Cheers brought in a number of, of spec writers on a number of things. Uh, so it's not like I was in the club, but I was circling the club, and they asked me to do four of them, and that's that's a genuine interest. I went to meetings three times and uh, spent a couple hours in pitch meetings. They, they don't have time to waste just to be nice to somebody they don't know. Um, so uh, there is a possibility of a, of a... You can pursue a writing career in L.A. You could. I don't think those days exist anymore. Those were the days when... Um, Cheers might have, you know, 20 million views or something on a, on a Thursday night. And, um, and the networks don't have that kind of money because those eyeballs are not in, in that kind of place. I don't think there's as many shows as there used to be. There may be. Certainly when you throw in cable, there's all kinds of stuff to write for. Um, but you wouldn't be writing the iconic stuff. I mean, you, you know, I don't know what's on Lifetime on a weekly basis, but there are plenty of dramas that have to be written. 
and comedies on all of these things. But it's not the same as, as uh, something like Cheers, because Cheers, Cheers was a cultural phenomenon, and those days are gone. Uh, network TV does not drive cultural phenomenon. I'm not aware of the last one that was impacted by, the last time I was impacted by something on network TV. Certainly, things like Game of Thrones and, and you know, all of this other stuff is, is terrific. Um, the problem is, uh, being a writer in this town um, is uh, it's a tough life. If I, had to, if I had to pick, in fact, it's a no-brainer, I'd much rather be trying to make a living as a writer in Hollywood than as an actor in Hollywood. Um, but uh, it's not an easy life, and um, and you have to uh, you have to be prepared to write and write and write and write and write. This is the problem for me because I'd always get fond of a script and I'd want to get the script done, and then maybe I could be talking and doing something else. But the people who were successful weren't so much attached to their scripts as they were attached to the writing. And it's just, the best way to think of it is you would have to sit down and write 25 scripts for, for Cheers or um, uh, Bob Newhart's show or, or anything like that. And, then, and you might just have to write the script, and as soon as it's finished, you had to just throw it in the fire. That's the way to think of it. Um, and when you threw enough of them into the fire, which means put them out there for them to disappear, sooner or later, if you had talent, sooner or later somebody would, um, would take a, a chance on you. Now, the good news about this, this business that doesn't make any sense is that you're on the, there's, there's almost no middle ground. There's some, but not, not a lot. You're either inside or outside. You're either working or you're not. Um, and if you get a script done uh, for a major show like Cheers, now you're a comedy writer for network TV. And getting the second and third one is essentially no-brainer. It's pretty much easy after that. If you can get a script on, on, on something with that kind of prestige, uh, people are going to come to you banging on your door. Agents are going to come banging on your door because you can make them a lot of money. Um, so uh, it's tough. But at the very, very least, the thing about being a writer as opposed to being an actor is at least if you're a writer, you're just throwing pages of paper into the furnace and not your actual self. Um, the hardest part about, an, about being an actor is um, you are the product, and there's nothing removed from it. It's kind of like being a, a pundit, I guess. Um, but when you go out on an audition and they say, no, not interested, it's not like they're, they're not interested in you. Um, and uh, and uh, that, that can be tough on the ego. And so the people I know who are successful actors in Hollywood all have the same exact attitude. It's a numbers game. They don't... They don't get attached to reads. Every now and then they'll do something, they'll do a read for something they really, really like, they'll audition for something they really like, and you may occasionally hear them say, oh, you know what, I actually got a little attached to that one. But the ones who are successful, it's like baseball, you know? You've got a batting average. It's just the way it is. Um, my friend Fritz, who's been my best friend pretty much all my life, uh, went through many years in the Florida market, in the Miami market, where he was batting like... 250, 300, which is unheard of, unheard of. But at the peak of his career in the Miami market, he was batting about 300. He was getting every third thing that he auditioned for. It's unheard of. I've never, ever seen anybody who got more than one out of 20 or something like that. So you just have to go. The way you get to be an actor in this town, aside from all the union things and all the rest of that stuff, is you go and go and go and go and go until you have, if you have talent, uh, then sooner or later you're going to appear in front of somebody who, who sees the talent and wants you. But one of the things that I've heard from Fritz and from many other actors is that, you know, they'll, they'll say, now, look, in retrospect, I'm sure a lot of this is just trying to let you down easy, but you'll hear people say, uh, Bill, you were absolutely perfect, absolutely perfect, um, but we were just looking for somebody whose hair was a little bit darker or blonder. And you just want to scream and just say, I, I can change that. Uh, we, were, we were looking for a blonde. There, there's tremendously, tremendously unimaginative people making decisions uh, about stuff that is, in fact, about nothing but imagination. Um, so, um, uh, yeah. Uh, so that, that aspect of it was, was 
was pretty cool. And, and, and sending in a script is not the same as going to an audition. It's not as much driving for one thing. Um, but as I've said before, for those of you who may be hearing this for the first time, if you're interested in making movies or being an actor, I would say that Los Angeles would be about the worst place you could possibly be. That's my personal opinion. Especially in this day and age. Uh, I really do believe that... Now, when I say talent will out, when I say talent will succeed, what I mean is great talent will, will succeed. I've seen a number of things where I thought, that's a good performance. And um, I've get, seen very few things where, where I said, that guy, I'm going to hire that guy. That guy I'm going to hire. Someday I'm going to hire that guy. And that's the kind of talent you have to have. If you have that, you're, you're on your way. And um, there is, uh, it, it's hard to put your finger on it. It really is lightning in a bottle. This guy who I mentioned a couple episodes ago, um, critical drinker, he does movie reviews in a really thick Scottish accent, but like the guys at Red Letter Media, he's, he's good. He's got good things to say. He's got smart things to say about the movies he's talking about, but he does it in such an entertaining way that I'm just hooked on it. Same thing for the guy, another guy I mentioned, the guy who does Oculus Imperia. He does uh, Warhammer 40,000 uh, lore, and he reads it like a monk, and he's got Gregorian chants going on in the background because 40K is... He's very gothic, and and he's just a great voice actor. He's just good, and um, and so those people are getting subscriptions. The problem is turning that into money in a full time job. Um, uh, that is the that is the problem. But uh, so there are more opportunities than ever before, and at the same time, there are there are more slots but the slots that are available are a lot shallower than they used to be. If you were a writer in the 80s and you had one episode of Cheers or Bob Newhart show or something, uh, you were pretty much set for life. Uh, and I, uh, we, the, day, the day of the sitcom is long gone. I mean, when I remember hearing people saying that Big Bang Theory was the most popular sitcom in America, I was really quite... Um, surprised because I didn't think that show was particularly funny but in any event I didn't think it was funny the way that the classics were and that's why they were classics all right so uh, let's see let's see let's see I can go back to Facebook again um, ah, it's very interesting um, questions here uh, that are all about writing and I almost never get those uh, here's one. I, it may I may have already answered it, but let's follow it up. Uh, it's uh, John Frost. Uh, as a writer, do you know when you're captured something that rises above the mundane and ordinary, or do you simply have to wait and see what the reader's response is? Having only a meager education from Hammerdown University, can a lowly industrial pipe fitter ever hope to be taken seriously as a writer? Yes. People don't read past the 499th word these days. How do you get past this hump without resorting to overblown sensationalism in paragraph two? My God, this is great questions. Uh, do people read for entertainment anymore? Do they have the time to waste on self-indulgence? A decent story, blah, blah, blah. Have you ever got a couple of hours of time to waste taking a trip to a magical place down at the end of the street? Uh, okay. Uh, geez, John, those are all great questions about writing, and it's fun to talk about writing because it's not politics, and I talk about politics a lot. Um, and so to just kind of add on to what it already uh, said, do I know when I've captured something that rises above the mundane? Yes, I absolutely do. Uh, there's no question about it. I, I find myself shocked at how much I like every one of the firewalls and afterburners that I've done. There have been many, many, many times when I thought I'm just going to sit down and pound out something and it's going to just be it's just going to be what it is because half of my work is below average. Uh, but I, I've been astonished at how much I like all of them. For, I don't think there's any exceptions. But there's no question that I know when I've hit something like really really on it. I know, I remember when I did um, number one with a bullet, I was so astonished at the end of that only because, um, only because the data fell into place so easily. I mean, I, I had the theory, I had the idea, and then, and then I did the little research and it's like, tink, 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 tink. You, are you serious? Are you kidding me? Wrote itself. Um, but yes, I know, uh, I know, I know when stuff is good. I know when it's not. And by the way, guys, since we're talking about show business and all this stuff, this episode, uh, there is one 
skill necessary to, to be a success? Well, let me rephrase that. There are many, many, many successes in, in show business in Hollywood that are not talented at all. So I'm talking about uh, uh, artistic success. The most important thing by far is you've got to know when something's good and when something's not good. Uh, you really, really have to know uh, what's good and what's not. And you also have to be committed to the idea that if it's not really good, you're, you're just going to gonna chuck it. The reason I have so much, the, the, the enormous major reason it's so hard for me to sit down and write is this everlasting fear that's not unique to me, I think every writer's ever had it, ever, is this everlasting fear that I'm not going to be able to write anything good, it's just going to be junk, and I just don't want to face it. And every time I sit down and start, start moving the fingers on the keyboard, it turns out, you know, pretty well. But um, I, uh, I just, you know, you gotta, you've got to get, You've got to know what's good and what's not good. And the only way you can do that is to do a bunch of not good stuff and then do some good stuff. Uh, another characteristic that a lot of writers and actors and stuff that I know have in common, I certainly feel this way, is it's virtually impossible for me to go back and read anything that I wrote more than two, three years ago. Uh, if I had to read Silent America now, uh, I just don't think I could take it. I am very, very proud of that uh, book. I'm very proud of those essays. I thought they were great, and I still think they're great. But looking back on it, uh, having done thousands and thousands and thousands of scripts since I, since I did those, um, if, you, if you're not embarrassed about the work that you did earlier in your career, then, then you're not improving, you know? It should be, you should be, um, uh, like, this is garbage. I wrote this seven years ago, it's junk. Uh, Trey Stevens says you're being too hard on yourself. I think you're probably right. It certainly is not uh, the best for your for your mental health. But the but the bottom line is, um, you have to have this quality. And if you don't, you're going to be um, you're going to be stuck in in mediocrity. That's the whole point of Ed Wood and, and that movie Ed Wood, which I've talked about so many times, where Ed Wood has this fictional meeting with Orson Welles. Both love movies. Both know how to make movies. Both are directors. One of them thinks that the audience won't notice if, if, if a woman's foot knocks a flat and the thing vibrates, and the other one will spend three days lighting one shot. It's just an, an unwillingness to settle for less, and you have to have the taste and the, and the perception to know. I mean, you could give Ed Wood, you could tell Ed Wood, you, you've got, not only do you have three days to light this scene, but you have to use three days to light this scene. After 40 minutes, Ed Wood is going to be sitting there for three days. He's not going to know what to do. He doesn't, he doesn't have the, the um, perception to, to realize that. Um, the, uh, and that's really, 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 really important. Um, really important is the perception to realize how, how much better c things could be. So if you've got some talent, you find yourself in this ongoing trap, and that is, I want it to be great, I want it to be perfect. Once it's written, it's not perfect, okay. I still want to get it as good as I can, and at what point do you kick it out the door because you have other things to deliver? Um, it, it, it's, that kind of thing is much tougher when you're working on scripts that have nothing to do with shows or deadlines or people or anything like that. It's just... It's just tough. But the hard part is cutting the stuff you love, as I've said before. There have been many times uh, where I've had to cut stuff I really liked, and, and that was the one sentence that I remember clearly about the, the Cheers um, spec sessions. It was, um, it was one of these guys, who was one of the story editor, chief story editor or something, and he was going through the script with me, and he was saying, this, 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 these three paragraphs here, that is about as well constructed of a joke as I've ever seen. It's perfect. It's a perfect joke and it's perfect payoff and it's funny, but you, you'd have to lose it. Okay, I understand, but why? Uh, he said, because it's not moving the story. And Cheers could afford to cut good stuff because Cheers was a brilliant show. Um, other shows that lasted a season, if that, would take any laugh they can get, and that's why they always stayed mediocre shows. They were mediocre. They were, 
they never went to the time to develop the characters. Um, it sure is nice to talk about entertainment instead of politics. Uh, one thing that's interesting, and you can see this in a lot of cases, uh, I mentioned um, Oculus Imperia and uh, Critical Drinker. I've seen it in both of them. Uh, and I've seen it many, many times in TV shows. And I've seen it with me. Um, when a TV show starts, uh, Simpsons is a great example, Family Guy is a great example. If you look at the, if, it, if it's the kind of show that goes on to become a classic and you get to really love it, you almost can't watch the first season or two because they haven't figured out how to be Simpsons yet. Um, it took The Simpsons two full years before, before season three, all of a sudden three to ten was just the best writing ever. But um, you, you don't know how to do it yet. You're on to something because you're still they're, you know, you're getting renewed, but, but you don't know how to do it. And when I listen to older stuff from Critical Drinker or Oculus or any of these other people, uh, internet historian, um, you look at the beginning stuff and, and what you find is the stuff that got you interested in them is, is everything they had at the beginning, but turned up, um, you know, turned up, uh, uh, Oculus Imperium guy, uh, initially read it with kind of a soft sort of an accent, but by the time I caught on to him, he was performing it as a monk, and he was writing it as a monk, and it was great, and he had the germ of the idea. You could tell it was there, but he hadn't figured it out yet, and this is true for uh, for everything. It's going to be true for these um, science fiction videos. Uh, I've got a clear idea of what I want to do with the characters, and I've got a clear idea of story arcs for three seasons of it. But I don't... That Those characters are not going to be defined until you define them. And the only way to define them is to write them. And, you, you know, if something's not working, you chuck it, and if, it's, if it is working, you keep it. But uh, this is one of the things that really is absolutely grand about showbiz. I, I, I'm just constantly, you know, dumping on show business all the time because of the ethics of it and the, and the you know, politics and all the rest of it. But, but I wouldn't be doing it if there wasn't something really, really wonderful about it. And, and the best part about um, movies and TV uh, and the kind of stuff we'll be doing uh, now, thanks to, uh, thanks to our patron, um, is, is uh, collaboration is great. And the, the best example of that is, uh, for me anyway, is I'll write a character and I'll put everything I can onto that page and then I'll hand that off to a good actor. And a good actor will look at this and the good actor doesn't have to worry about the movie. He doesn't have to worry about anything. He doesn't have to worry about the lighting or the, or the electrical. He doesn't have to worry about costumes. He doesn't have to worry about the other characters. All he worries about is this one guy and looks at the at the outline of this personality that I put in there with a couple of lines and manages to fill in the gaps. And it's an astonishingly great feeling to create a character and then have an actor come back with the character much better than he was before you hand it to him. That is a, is a big deal. Uh, we've been talking about Star Trek on and off in the comment section. Um, you know, William Shatner came at Captain Kirk in a certain way, and after a few episodes, people began to, the writers, the writing staff, and the producers began to realize, this is good, we like this, this not so much. Um, and so, you know, with Kirk, you got the, um, he learned how to, he learned, you learned how to make a joke, you know, you learned, you learned how to tell a Kirk joke, um, and a Kirk joke, the classic Kirk joke is, is, uh, is the embarrassment joke. Um, the, 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 great, the best way to get humor from James Kirk is to embarrass him. And a perfect example of that is in Trouble with Tribbles when um, there's a big fight with the Klingons down there and Kirk's got the guys that were down on the fight lined up and Scotty was one of them. And he goes down there and says, I thought I told you not to fight. That's why I sent you, Mr. Scott. Yes, sir, but they insulted us. They insulted the Enterprise. Insulted the Enterprise, did they? They said, yes, sir. Um, and, and, and the crew, yes, sir. Well, what did they say? Uh, they said that you, Captain, what was it? you were a Denebian slime devil. And Kirk says, mm, okay. And that's when you hit him. No, sir. You told us we had to mind our, you know, mind our manners. But he called the Enterprise a garbage cow, and that's, that's when I hit him. And that's, that's great writing. 
because it's believable. It doesn't it doesn't detract, uh, and and at the same time, it shows you Kirk is a good sport. At the same, but but he, it, it's that kind of embarrassing humor. By the way, um, uh, the critical drinker had an episode on the original uh, on the reboot Star Trek movies, and he's very very hard on them. He's absolutely right. Um, I let the gloss of those movies kind of make me feel better about them than they are. Uh, but I remember when the first trailer for the, the for the first Star Trek movie came out uh, in 2009. I remember thinking, so what is so Kirk is what? He's a motorcycle guy who 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 who, who lives by his fists. Is that it? He's just a guy who fights. And Critical Drinker goes and takes a look at these movies and just he was dealing with inner darkness. And he said, yeah, in the original, you've got this guy sitting on a box, suffering because he knows that his arrogance has cost him his crew and maybe the lives of his entire crew and maybe a ship and maybe the whole galaxy. And he's suffering and he's thinking and he's quiet and then he does all of these things. Um, and then in, in, the, in the reboot, it's all just action. It's just punch, punch, run, run, punch, run, punch, punch. Um, it, it, it's a very, 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 very good uh, analysis of why the original was so much better. And he's got a very good analysis on reboots in general. All right, we have three minutes and 45 seconds left. I might be able to do one more real fast here. Um, who did, Was it Dave Big Booty I was said I was going to look for? Let's see if we can find it. Uh, Eric Blake. Not looking at the, at the um, not looking, my God, Eric Blake has 25 questions here. We'll do some more of this next time. I like talking about um, uh, this stuff. Um, all right, let me go to the comment section, see if I can find it. Uh, Dave, I don't know what, what it was. Director's cut of the motion picture is best viewed on DVD where you can zip through all the cloud formation and space stations. Exactly. Uh, the original Star Trek, the motion picture is just, it's, it's painful. It's just painful. Slow. Um, anyway, uh, so um, that's uh, that's it, Dave. If you can, if you have a chance to um, put something in there, and, okay. Well, I can't see it, and we got two minutes and forty-four seconds left. Um, unless it's under a different name. Uh, Steve Jenner, John Frost, and Gene Let me check one more time. It might be under a different name, I'm sure. Um, and I don't think we're going to have time to get to it. So we'll be able to get to it next time. Um, let me look one more time here. Uh, oh, does D D Dave Olson is here. I'll be damned, Dave. How about that? I did not know that those two people were the same person. I did, didn't know. How about that? Um, Wow, I thought those were two great guys. Turns out it's one great guy. Um, we don't, the question was, do we have a store at BillWiddle.com? We had one when we started. Um, we still have a closet of uh, T-shirts back there. We've been getting the rest of the stuff out slowly, just, you know. But uh, we, we started with the idea that we would have a store and it would make a lot of money, and it was by far the worst decision uh, that I'd made. Um, in terms of getting this business set up, uh, it was, um, you know, just, just doing the fulfillment on these things was just a ton of work, and you've got obligations, and you're late. When we first opened our doors, um, I tried to get people to pack boxes, and I'm not making this up. They would put a people I got in touch with, they, they'd take a box big enough to put a mug in there, they'd put in the mug, and I've seen people showing me pictures of how the mug arrived, broken, and there were three packing peanuts in there, and it was just like every single one of them was broken. It went out again and again and again. I was like, oh, my God, what the hell am I doing? Um, anyway, uh, I was listening to something about this uh, dealing with Star Citizen, great uh, article on Star Citizen, great series of videos on Star Citizen, not very complimentary but very, very insightful. And they were talking about the difference between um, fulfillment of something that's real, like a T-shirt or a mug or something, um, versus something like a digital download, which doesn't cost you anything. And certainly is the way to go, um, because fulfillment alone, just fulfillment, is a is a bear. It's really tough, for, especially on a on an organization this size. Um, uh, Matt Harris says his mug was perfect. Glad to hear it. Um, so uh, I am oh. 
Uh, Rough Waters has got a question about Air Force cadets and gliders, and I don't have time to do it, um, Rough Waters. Please bring it back uh, next time, though I'd really appreciate it because we've got seven seconds now, and I'm going to close this show with a thank you, as always, to our members, and we'll see you next time on the Stratosphere Lounge. Stop it, Bells! <laughs>